Okay, uh, I need to preface this video with a couple of things. First of all, um, I uh, am having some work done in my house today, so if you're hearing some banging and stuff going on in the background, that's what that is. Um, hopefully it's not too big of a distraction. Um, second thing, I had already started shooting this video uh, when I had uh, an issue with my recording device, aka my phone, and lost that video. So I had already worked through this example, which is why you see the work written here. I'm just going to talk through what's already written, um, and then we'll just move on from here. So uh, we're doing one more Laplace transform. This time the function is sine of kt, where k is just any constant. And by definition, that would be this, the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st sine of kt dt. Um, this is pretty easy to see that we would need integration by parts. So if you use integration by parts on this function, you're going to get this. Okay, negative e to the negative st sine of kt over s. And again, from 0 to infinity plus um, k and s would both be constants, and those would uh, those would appear in the in your choice of u and uh, v, or um, those would be uh, those would show up here as a consequence of your choice of u and dv in this uh, application of integration by parts. Being constants, I just pulled them out of the integral, and now I have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative st uh, cosine of kt dt. Okay, um, now for this guy right here, if you evaluate this at these limits of integration here, so for infinity, um, e to the negative st, you have this exponent going towards negative infinity, which shrinks this factor down to zero, making this whole thing go down to zero. Alternatively, when you plug zero in, uh, sine of zero is also zero. So this thing zeroes out completely, and uh, I'm just going to go like this, zero. Okay, leaving us with this. Now notice I, I need to use another application of integration by parts here. So this integral, um, I'm going to use parts one more time, remembering that there's a k over s on the outside of that. Integration by parts on this guy is going to give me a similar looking uh, expression here. Um, cosine of kt here instead of sine of kt, sine of kt here instead of cosine of kt, and then this is also going to be a minus now. Um, but uh, working this out, uh, this time this will not go to zero. Um, as, as we take t towards infinity, this factor still goes to zero. But then uh, uh, plugging a zero in to this expression is going to give me a negative 1 times 1 over s. So this becomes negative 1 over s, but being the lower limit of integration, I would have been subtracting that from zero, making it a positive 1 over s. Okay, now here, um, rather than evaluate this integral directly, which would just kind of take me back a couple of steps, I'm going to notice that the integral itself is, by definition, the Laplace transform of sine of kt. So this is kind of what we started with, just this guy. I'm going to write that as the Laplace transform of sine of kt here. Okay, and then the goal is to try and isolate this. So if I distributed the k over s into both of these terms, I'll get k over s squared here minus k squared over s squared here. Now trace that all the way back up here, and I could take this entire term here, this negative k squared over s squared Laplace transform of sine of kt, add that over to this guy. Bearing in mind that I would need a common denominator, so this I could put an s squared over s squared in front of it, adding a uh, k squared over s squared to that would give me k squared plus s squared over s squared times the Laplace transform of sine of kt equals this, k over s squared, this guy right here. Finally, uh, multiplying both sides by the reciprocal of this factor right here would give me my end result. And you can probably hear all that sound <laughs> up above me. Um, so hopefully that's not too distracting. So my Laplace transform of sine of kt ends up being k over s squared plus k squared. Okay, now I already showed you this table in the previous video, but notice that's that's the uh, part D here is what we just found. Sine of kt equals k over s squared plus k squared. We're not going to derive all of these because the derivation follows pretty much you know, the same or similar steps as what we've already seen. But we've done a lot of work um, deriving various different Laplace transforms, and these are some common and important ones that we need to know. Now, oftentimes, um, the functions that we're going to be <clears throat> uh, trying to find Laplace transforms of 
are not necessarily just one of these types. Sometimes we're dealing with linear combinations of various different types of functions. And in those cases, we don't need to go all the way through an entire derivation again. We get to use the very, very useful property of Laplace transforms, which is linearity. And the linearity of uh, Laplace transforms just follows from the linearity of the integral. Notice if I wanted to evaluate the Laplace transform of some constant alpha times a function f of t plus another constant beta times g of t, some other function, then I'm taking this entire function on the inside here and multiplying it by e to the negative st and integrating that from zero to infinity. But if you distribute that exponential function in and then break up your integral into two integrals using the addition here and pull the constants out, I see that this is the same thing as this, which by definition is alpha times the Laplace transform of f of t plus beta times the Laplace transform of g of t. And the idea there is that even though this linear combination might be a complicated looking function, f of t and g of t might be much simpler types of functions. They may be the types of functions that appear in this table. So breaking it down into this uh, into this form allows us to use the results we've already come up with to avoid any further you know integration. So to give you an example of how we would use that, and this is not at all you know an excessively complicated type of function that we would need to be doing this with. Um, if I wanted to find the Laplace transform of this guy, 2t squared minus 5t plus cosh of t, all I need to do is use the linearity of my Laplace transform. This thing is the same as 2 times the Laplace transform of t squared minus 5 times the Laplace transform of t plus the Laplace transform of cosh of t. And now, what you want to do is go to your table, and I'll, I'll mention this as well. Uh, typically, when you're learning about Laplace transforms, um, you're not you're not really trying to memorize this whole table, uh, and and there's even more that we could add to this with, for other types of functions. Usually, you have a table in front of you, and you're using it for reference. So we're dealing with a couple of functions of this type, monomials. So I want to use this expression, n factorial over s, n plus 1. We're also using a cosh of t. In, in our case, it's just cosh of t, which means k is equal to 1. So reading off the table, this would be equal to 2 times uh, 2 factorial, which is 2, over s to the 2 plus 1 power, which is 3, minus 5 times, what's the Laplace transform of t? Well, I use the same, uh, the same um, function or the formula for that table. It's 1 factorial, which is just 1, over s to the 1 plus 1 power, which is 2, plus the Laplace transform of cosh of t, which we just saw on that previous table, is s over s squared minus k squared, but in our case, k is 1, so this is minus 1, okay? And uh, I can multiply some stuff here just to make it a little bit simpler. 4 over s cubed minus 5 over s squared plus s over s squared minus 1. And I could, you know, I could do some additional algebraic steps to kind of combine these into one rational expression. I'm not going to worry about that here. The point was just to show you how to take a complicated function, apply the linearity of the Laplace transform to it to make the problem much easier to solve. Notice we didn't have to do any integration here because we're using past results now. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, when we first define the Laplace transform, you know, we defined it as a, a an improper integral. And we mentioned that, you know, improper integrals, like an integral from zero to infinity, what we're dealing with here, may fail to converge. It may not, may not actually exist. And so far, all of the examples that we've done have been of functions that do, in fact, exist. Um, but uh, it would be nice if we could have some way of determining ahead of time, before we try to do any integration, whether a function will have a Laplace transform or not, whether that improper integral will, will converge or not. And the way that we're going to test that is by determining whether or not a particular function is uh, of what we call exponential order. 
And so here's, here's our definition of what exponential order is. We say that a function f is of exponential order if we can find constants, lowercase c, a positive constant capital M, and a positive constant capital T, uh, such that the absolute value of f of t is less than or equal to m times e to the c of t, uh, the power of c of t for all lowercase t greater than t. Now this, this, this feels like there's a lot going on here. Um, but let me just kind of say what this is talking about. So first of all, what's the purpose of this capital T right here? Notice the only place it shows up on this part of our definition is where it says for all lowercase t greater than t. What this implies is that uh, even though it's not explicitly stated here, we're talking about a limit as little t goes to infinity. And basically what we're saying is that <clears throat> The absolute value of our function that we're trying to determine whether or not it's of exponential order, we want the limit as this absolute value of f of t goes, as t goes to infinity of this function, we want its limit to be less than or equal to the limit of this function as t goes to infinity. Okay? Now, an easier way to test this. Um, so this right here can be written alternatively this way. We want the limit as little t goes to infinity of the absolute value of f of t over, I'm gonna divide by that e to the ct, so that all I have is a constant on this side, okay? I kinda of crammed that in there. But another way of saying uh, this exact same definition is to say that uh, the, the function f of t is of exponential order if the limit as t goes to infinity of the absolute value of f of t over e to the ct, where c is some constant, uh, is less than some positive constant m. And it doesn't matter what this m is. We just need to know that such an m exists and such a c exists to make this work. But this limit is... is the, as t goes to infinity is kind of what we're saying with this capital T and this little t greater than t here, okay? So um, here graphically is what it looks like for a function to be of exponential order. Take this one for example. Suppose we've already found some capital M and some lowercase c to put into this side of our inequality, and it determines this exponential function, this red function here. Now let's suppose that we graphed f of t. Um, in this case, f of t is of exponential order because at some constant capital T, once we get past that, for all uh, little t greater than that capital T, our function is going to lie below that exponential function. It doesn't matter what's happening before that capital T, but uh, we have to at eventually get to a point where the blue graph lies completely below the red graph for the rest of whatever's left to the right over here. Okay, and in what uh, one way of saying that is that um, this blue function f of t is bounded above by m e to the c t. Or another way of saying that as well is that this exponential function m e to the c t dominates this blue function f of t. Okay, here's an example of a function that is not of exponential order e to the t squared. Um, for this, uh, no matter what we plug in for m or c to create an exponential function here, the function e to the t squared will always eventually dominate that red function, okay? So there are no choices of m and c that would make this red function dominate the blue one, okay? Um, so let's do one example where we want to show that a particular function is of exponential order. Yeah, f of t equals 3 sine of t. We've already evaluated the Laplace transform of sine of kt. We know it exists, um, but I want to see if I can apply this definition. And to use the definition, it's much easier to use this guy right here. So first of all, I have an absolute value of f of t showing up in there. What is the absolute value of f of t? Well, um, that's the absolute value of 3 sine of t, or equivalently, 3 times the absolute value of sine of t. And one thing I know about the sine of t is that its absolute value is always less than or equal to 1. That's from the range of the sine function, which means this is always less than or equal to 3. Okay? Now, 
let's apply our definition. What can I say about the limit as t approaches infinity of the absolute value of f of t over e and to the ct, but remember c can be any constant as long as some constant c exists that does what we're trying to do then we're good. So I'm going to let c equal 1 in this case because that's going to be sufficient. Um, what can I say about this? Well, I just said up here that the absolute value of f of t is less than or equal to 3, and that implies from our limit laws an inequality here as well. The limit as t approaches infinity of uh, 3 over e to the t. So this limit is going to be less than or equal to this limit. But what can I say about this limit? Well, t only appears here, and this denominator is very clearly going to go to infinity, which means this limit is going to go to 0. And what was it that we were trying to show? We were just trying to show that this limit, whatever it is, is less than or equal to some positive number. It doesn't matter what positive number, just any positive number. Well, our limit in this case is definitely less than uh, or equal to, but I can just say less than, that's enough, 1. That's, that's a constant that's positive. So uh, we've established that this is of exponential order. Okay, What that means, according to this next theorem, is that a Laplace transform will exist. In fact, we're going to be a little bit more specific here. So... Um, <clears throat> If f is a piecewise continuous function on the interval 0 to infinity, and if it's of exponential order, which we just defined, then our Laplace transform of that function f of t is guaranteed to exist for s greater than uh, some constant c. Okay, And that constant c there is the same constant that appears in uh, the definition of exponential order. It's part of, that, um, part of that exponent on the e that we saw there. So we're going to prove this here. Um, so uh, again, we're going to use that additive uh, property of integrals. If I wanted to evaluate the Laplace transform of f of t, and if we knew that um, our Laplace transform was of exponential order, which again, here's our definition of that. For every t greater than this constant, uh, this, this constant capital T, we have this inequality, okay? So uh, that capital T right there is what I'm going to use to split my integral up into two integrals, okay? So I'm going to evaluate the integral from 0 to t of e to the negative st f of t dt, plus the integral from capital T to infinity of e to the negative st f of t dt. And notice this is written as i1 plus i2, just because it's easier to reference that. So i1 is what we're going to be calling this integral, i2 is this integral, okay? Now, uh, remember, the, the goal here is just to determine if this Laplace transform exists. And so, um, looking at this one, we're on a finite integral here. This one from zero to, to this positive constant t is, an, is a uh, definite integral. It is not an improper integral. And because f of t is piecewise continuous and e to the negative st is continuous, then their product is piecewise continuous. And we know from calculus uh, one or two, I can't remember which one we talk about this, um, we know from integral calculus that this definite integral is guaranteed to exist uh, as long as that's an, a finite interval and this is a piecewise continuous function. So this for sure exists, I1, okay? Um, now, the, the trickier integral is I2, but this is where we want to use that exponential order idea. So here's what we know. Because f of t is of exponential order, um, we know that the absolute value of f of t is less than or equal to some constant m times e to the ct, for some constant c. So we're going to use some inequality properties of integrals to uh, say what we can say about i2. So, namely, we're going to deal with capital or the uh, absolute value of i2. Now, you may be a little bit rusty on some of your integral properties, specifically ones dealing with inequalities. You don't do a whole lot with them in Calculus 2, but they become really important in classes like this one. So if you take the absolute value of an entire integral like this, we know from Calculus 
one or two, I think it's calculus one, we talk about this, that that absolute value is always less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of your integrand, which is what this would look like. So this inequality, this first step here, follows from your basic properties of integrals. Now, f of t, first of all, e to the negative st is always going to be positive. So this thing is the same thing as e to the negative st times the absolute value of f of t. But the absolute value of f of t is less than or equal to m e to the ct, which gives us another inequality from our uh, integral properties. And we can bring that constant m out as well. So this is going to be less than or equal to m times the integral from t to infinity of e to the negative st, which we're seeing here, e to the ct dt. Now I can combine those, okay? This is the same thing as m times the integral from t to infinity, e to the negative s minus ct dt. Um, and this integral, notice, if s is chosen to be greater than c, then the s minus c in parentheses here will be positive, implying that this minus out here gives us a negative, uh, a negative um, exponent here. So if I were to evaluate this integral, I would get this, uh, this expression right here. And if I take the limit um, as t goes to infinity, then this exp the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, expo the exponential part of that is going to go to zero. Okay, because we're choosing s to be greater than c. Leaving me with just this part after plugging in my lower limit of integration. Okay, so that means that our integral i2 converges because we found a finite value that it's equal to. Okay, um, and the, uh, or sorry, that we showed that this integral converges, but by the comparison test for integrals, this integral right here, which is less than or equal to this one, must converge as well. So what that means is we have a sum of two convergent integrals, which means our Laplace transform the integral that defines that must converge as well, meaning the Laplace transform exists for s greater than c. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop this video here. In our next example, we're going to find a Laplace transform of a piecewise defined function.